I am excited about next Sunday uh, for several reasons. One, I'm really looking forward to hearing from Tim Lee. Uh, Tim, uh, just the, his, his uh, biography is, is amazing, but um, of course, uh, a, a part of that was his service to our country as a, as a Marine. He was leading a group of Marines up a hill uh, to clear mines, and he lost both of his legs uh, in an explosion. Uh, which could have turned him bitter, could have turned him away, but instead propelled him uh, into the grace of God. And and now his testimony is of God's faithfulness. And the Lord has used that in thousands of ways. Uh, He he speaks to Marines, at um, um, uh, both recruits and Marines every year. So he's he's got to speak to tens of thousands uh, of them about his faith in Christ. Uh, He's been on numerous boards appointed by presidents for veterans, um, but most of all, he, he has, he's been a pastor, and he has a pastor's heart, and so he comes to share the gospel next week, and I'm excited to hear from him. But, but most of all, I'm excited because it's two of my friends have already said yes that they're going to come uh, that are on my list, and the, um, I'm encouraging you today. I told you I'm going to ask you about this. Have, have you been right? Have you been praying for these folks that God's put on your heart? Are you inviting them? Have you invited them? Well, you've only got a week now, um, a little less than a week now. Uh, so make sure you make that invitation. Uh, go and have maybe lunch with them this week or promise to go out to lunch with them next Sunday, but make that invitation uh, because I believe God's going to use uh, Tim's testimony in a powerful way. And if you don't invite them, they won't be here. All right? Uh, we have this responsibility. See, the gospel is good news. <laughs> That's what it means. The word gospel means good news. And it is good news that, that Jesus, the Son of God, died for our sins, rose again from the dead, and, and, and has arisen and has ascended into, into heaven as by, in the right hand of the Father. There is, it's good news that there is now no condemnation for those who believe in Him. There is everlasting joy available. That's the gospel. And you never... You never outgrow your need for the gospel. It doesn't matter how long you've been a believer. We need the gospel. We need to hear it. We need to speak it. Uh, it it's not just what enters us into the Christian life, but uh, it sustains us in the Christian life. We grow stronger and stronger in the gospel until the day we die. And as we grow in the gospel, we grow in our awareness that this is indeed good news for, not just for us, but for the world. That all people need to hear this, need to hear this good news. And I know we talk about that at church. We talk about sharing our faith. We talk about evangelism. We talk about missions. But I, I have this suspicion that most of us think that, well, that's just for missionaries and that's just for pastors. Uh, but that's not true. It's for every one of us. Uh, we are to be faithful in the gospel. Now, as we think about that, this morning, I, I want to talk just a little bit about the importance of friends in that. You see, when we read the New Testament, we read the examples of people coming to faith, uh, we'll see that the most frequent method of evangelism is relationships. Relationships that are built one by one. Relationships that are redemptive, meaning there's, a, there's an intention that, I, that we're building relationships so that people will see Christ in us, so that they will hear Christ from us. These are redemptive relationships that lead to gospel conversations. And when we, as I said, when we read through the New Testament, we see that's, that's the method. You know, even when you look at the the great events like Pentecost, for example, when 3,000 come to faith, well, that sounds like a crusade, but in reality, it's relationship-based because it was the 120 that went out from the upper room and and went into the streets and began to speak to people in their heart language, and as a result, the, the, the crowds were stirred up. They were excited to hear what this is all about, and so, yes, they came and they heard the gospel message. And we're saved. 
Surveys of Christians reveal how people came to faith in Christ. 7% came because of a pastor. 4% came because of a special need. 2% came because of a church visitation program. 6% came because of small groups. 0.01% came as a result of an evangelistic crusade. But 80% came by the invitation of a friend. Have you ever thought of the fact that the Great Commission that Jesus gave us to go into all the world is, is yes, geographical, but it's also relational? When Jesus said we're to go to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth, when he spoke that to his disciples, spoke these place names of Jerusalem, that's home. You know, that's, that's, that's their home ground. That's their home capital. That's where they're from. When he spoke of Judea, that's their neighbors. When he speaks of Samaria, they're enemies. When he speaks of the world, strangers. There are relationships in all of that. And, and God has placed people in your life that, that fit into those, those slots. You know, they're people from home, family. There's your neighbors. Uh, there's those across town. There's strangers. There's even enemies. But yet all of them are loved by God, and all of them are worthy of the gospel, and all of them are our responsibility. God has placed people in your life, and you have unique relationships with them, and they need the gospel. So this morning I'm going to ask us to look at Romans chapter 1, and I'm turning to Romans chapter 1 as, as Paul is writing to well, to the church and believers and whoever would read his letter in Rome, I would point out before we read this morning that Paul hasn't been to Rome. He wants to go, and you'll hear that in his words. He wants to meet these folks. He wants to build a relationship with them. He has an, there's an intentionality in his words and in this letter. And as we read it today, I think there's instruction for you and me about how we should Serve the Lord by building redemptive relationships, by making friends for Jesus. And so I'm going to ask, we're going to read uh, chapter 1, we'll read verses 8 through 15 this morning. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because the good news of your faith is being reported in all the world. God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit and in telling the good news about his son, that I constantly mention you, always asking in my prayers that if it is somehow in God's will that I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I want very much to see you, so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Now I, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I often have planned to come to you, but was prevented until now, in order that I might have a, fruit, a fruitful ministry among you, just as I have among the rest of the Gentiles. For I'm obligated, both to the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome." Let me pause here and we'll ask God's blessing on the reading of his word. Father, we come to thank you for, for giving us this wonderful gift, the Bible, that we might know of you, that we might learn of you. And Lord, from the Bible, we've learned of this great gospel, this good news of salvation you've given to us. And Lord, we learn how to, how to relate to you and how to pray and, and how to grow in our faith. But also from your word, we learn how to live. Lord, we want to live in a way that honors you. And as we look at this letter that you've preserved for us, as your Holy Spirit inspires Paul to write, Lord, help us to see in him what, what we need to model in our own lives as we would build relationships for gospel conversations, for your kingdom and for your glory. So teach us, Lord, today we pray in Christ's name. Amen. 
Now, the first thing I, I notice as I, as I read Paul's words to, to these folks, for the most part, he does not know, I notice that there's a very positive tone in Paul's words. And that tone, I believe, reflects an attitude within him uh, that he wants to express, a positive attitude. He wants people to pick up on. He wants them to hear as they read the letter. And if we are to follow his example, and I think one of the things we understand, we need to understand is that that means that we also need to be positive, and we need to look for good things in other people. Notice his words. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. Everywhere Paul went, he built... Lasting friendships, meaningful relationships. Just a quick read through Acts shows you uh, all, of, all of these relationships that, that Paul has, has built, friends of his, from, from Barnabas to Titus to Silas to Luke to Priscilla, Aquila, uh, Lydia, uh, Epaphrodites, John Mark, the Ephesian elders that he wept with on the shore I mean, these are deep and meaningful relationships. And here in Rome, if you just, if you take, if we're here looking at this letter, if you look back to the very last chapter of Romans, say chapter 16, I'm not going to take the time to read it all for you, but chapter 16 begins with these words, I commend to you our sister uh, Phoebe, who is a, a servant in the church of Sincerea, and so you should you should welcome her in the Lord and in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever matter she may require of your help. For indeed, she has been a benefactor uh, to many and also to me. I give my, my greetings to Prisca and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ, who risked their neck for my life. Not only do I thank them, but so does all the Gentile churches. Greet also the churches that meet in their home. Greet my dear friend. Uh, Aphinus, who is the first convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary. And on he goes. In fact, he lists 30 names of people he knows there in Rome, people he has a relationship uh, with in Rome. And it just gushes uh, with affection. And it magnifies the gospel. Many of these names are names we were introduced to, people we were introduced to in the book of Acts. And from that, I would point out this. Though that list of friends that, that's in Rome that he's uh, expressing these words of, of love and affection for, that list reflects a wide range of people, uh, demonstrates a beautiful diversity in race or in, in gender, in rank, uh, and he expresses honor to each one of them in such a wonderful way that we see that Paul was an awesome friend maker because he was an awesome friend. He has this positive attitude. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. So let me, let me just say that Having a grateful heart goes a long way to setting your attitude in a positive nature. Think about the people that God's put into your life. What is your attitude towards them? Would you say it's generally positive or more likely negative? Right? We're usually pretty quick to think of all the negative things in people around us. I want, I'm, I'm asking you to, to understand that every relationship that God has given you is a gift, even the hard ones, and that God would use you in them. So we need to start with a positive attitude because there's nothing like a long face that's going to shorten one's list of friends. Attitude is critical. And as we take Paul's example here, and lift it up, then, then what we need to do is be positive and lift up others. There's high 
commendation in his words to the, the people and many of whom he doesn't know in Rome. So how do we get to that place? What, what are some things that we need to do to be a, have a positive attitude about the people around us? Well, let me suggest uh, uh, at least one thing is you have to be a, a careful listener. Or maybe I should better say a selective listener. What do I mean by that? Is well, uh, if I look at Paul and his, his words about the church in Rome, I would have to point to the fact that, you know, he, he just listened, <laughs> uh, he listened to the good things and ignored the, the bad things. Because there's a lot being said about the, the, the people in Rome, about the church in Rome. There was a lot being said by, by the Romans themselves that was negative and derogatory. They, they called them atheists. They called them cannibals. They had made up all kinds of evil stories about them. And, and the Jews and the Judaizers had all kinds of, of negative words about them, calling them drunkards and uh, sinners and Paul listened for the good reports. He practiced selective listening. And you and I have to be careful what we ingest about what others say about others, right? Um, friend, you need to understand we are in a spiritual battle. Right? The enemy, there's an enemy that wants to keep you from building Christ-honoring friendships and he will use gossips to build walls, to divide people. He'll spread negative word about people you haven't even met. And, and if you listen to those things, they will give you this, this, this attitude about a person you've never even met that causes you not even want to get to know them. I think most of us have had that experience. We've heard things about someone, we had a predetermined attitude about who they are, and we've avoided them. But then when we got to know them, we discovered they weren't at all what we thought. Listen. Listen for good things. Have a positive attitude about people. And, I, and, and then just the, I'll just say this, listen more than you speak. That'll make a difference. It works this way. You know, an egotist talks to you about themselves. A gossip talks to you about others. A brilliant conversationalist talks to you about you. It's just the way it is. If you want to build relationships, it's an investment in time. It's an investment in, in learning about other people and being willing to listen and ask questions and help you discover who, you are, who they are, but, but also help you discover how to connect with them. Norman Douglas wrote, he said, to find a friend, one must close one eye. To keep a friend, both. The biblical word for this is Grace. Right? We're to be ministers of God's grace. His grace has freely flowed into our lives, and therefore it is to flow out of our lives and our relationships. That we give grace to people. We forgive them. We bless them. I know every time we, we talk about biblical forgiveness, about the, the call of God in our lives to forgive others, people struggle with that. You know, how can I forgive them? Why should I forgive them? How often should I forgive them? How much has God forgiven you? How much do you need God's forgiveness? How much do you need his grace? Well, the people around you need that same grace, and it needs to come from you. Let me go on as we look at Paul here. We need to take from his example. We need to learn how to, to bless and compliment other people in our lives. Paul says, I've heard great things about you and your, your faithfulness. He compliments them, indicating his concern for them. And he does that by telling them that he's praying for them. But these are all words of endearment. And one of the greatest compliments you can give to someone is to, is to listen to them with interest. You make more friends by just being interested in them than by trying to have them become interested in you. 
Be interested in them. Proverbs 18, 24 says, to have a friend, one must be friendly. And I know that sounds basic, simple, but I ask you, well, how many people in the past week were you unfriendly towards? Now, we have all kinds of rationalization. Well, I'm just so busy, I don't have time to talk with people. She's just a checkout clerk. He's just a gas station guy. You know, I, I don't have time. But friend, every person, every person you come into contact with is a, is a divine appointment. There's an opportunity for a conversation that could build a relationship that God could use redemptively and for his kingdom. So take Paul's example here. Have a positive attitude. Listen carefully or selectively. Tell people the good that you see. And most importantly, the good that you see in them or or hear in them. And find ways to bless them. You know, the Bible has a whole theology of blessing. If you take the time and read it with that in mind, you'll see throughout the Old Testament the importance of the blessing. What is a blessing? Well, a blessing is essentially good words spoken to and for and over someone else. Saying good things about them. And, and heightening that in, in, the, in the context in which we are in faith, we say blessings of God on others as well. We call upon God to bless and encourage and strengthen others. These are words of blessing. You know, in the Old Testament, we see that passed on from generation to generation. One, one generation would bless the next generation. We hear instruction that was given to Moses that he was to bless, that Aaron was to bless. They were given the words of blessing. God told them to bless the people by saying, the Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord deal kindly and graciously with you. The Lord bestow his favor upon you and give you peace. But it's not just an Old Testament practice, it's a New Testament practice. I'm not, not going to take the time, but in almost every one of the letters, the pastoral epistles, the letters to the churches, there are blessings given to the hearer. But friends, we are to be that source of blessing. We are to bless the people in our life. And the way we bless them is just like Paul's doing here. Speaking good about them. Speaking good to them. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord give you joy. Good words spoken to and about the hearer. These, these deepen the relationships in your life. Friend, understand, you have, you have something to give. What, you've, what you have to give is what Christ has given you. If you are in the faith, you have faith to give. If you've received God's grace, you have grace to give. If you've responded to the gospel, you have the gospel to give. You have much to give to the people around you. So build relationships, build friendships for Jesus. And be intentional. You hear the intentionality in, in Paul's words Uh, Verse 9, he says, And I remember you in my prayers at all times. I pray that that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. He's had this intention, and he describes it later on. He says, I've been planning this for a long time. I want to come to you. I want to invest in you. He says, but I'm praying for you. Right now, I'm praying for you. Doesn't it mean a lot to you when someone says, I'm, I'm praying for you? Doesn't it bless you to know that someone's praying for you? That they care enough about you to pray for you? Well, friend, take the opportunity to, to do that with others. Just to, what more positive thing can you say than I'm, I, I am praying for you? Friend, friendships don't just come out of thin air. I mean, they don't just appear. Often counsel with a person who says, well, I just, don't, I just don't have any friends. And I ask a few questions, and after a while, it seems like they feel like it's everybody else's problem that I don't have any friends. You know, they should all want to be my friends. But the reality is, the, the, the situation is, you have to be friendly to have friends, right? You, you have to work at it. Friendship is not easy. 
It's an investment. You have to be intentional. Paul shows his intentionality in that he's telling them he's praying for them. And I'm, I'm just encouraging you that, that you can do the same. Show it honest concern for other people. That's what friendships are built on. Paul's saying, you know, at long last, I'm, I'm going to come to you. I have this concern for you. I want to invest in you. But you have to think about others first to build friendships. Recognize their needs. Respond to their needs. Pray for them. Lift them up. We have to have this attitude. Paul would teach it and to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 2 when he writes these words. He says, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Your attitude should be the same of Jesus Christ. That phrase, consider others better than yourself, it it means consider others before yourself. It's it's putting them in a position where you're responding to their need before you're responding to your need. And this is the love of Christ. And then then he points to Christ as the example of that. Because when we look at Christ, that's exactly what Christ did. He considered our need before his own. And therefore, he was willing to go to the cross. In fact, he, it is Jesus who says, you know, a friend has no greater love than this, than his willingness to lay down his life for his friends. Friendship takes work. Like all the other things in life that are worthwhile, it takes hard work. And each... Of these potential relationships and each of the relationships you already have are divine opportunities with op, uh, opportunities for gospel conversations and to build them for his glory. Now, Jesus gave us a prescription for building better relationships no matter how bad those relationships are. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, he instructs us that we're to love others, that there were even love our enemies, and he doesn't just leave it there for us to figure out how to do that. He tells us how to do that. In verse 44 of chapter 5, Matthew 5, he says, I tell you, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who persecute you. All right, to bless, we already talked about blessing, the importance of that, to speak good words towards them. You know, how do you take a person who's a stranger or even a person who's an enemy and make them a friend? Well, he says you begin by blessing them, to say good things about them, to say good things to them, and then do good to them. Look for ways that you can do something good for them. Now, if you're not a good cook, then don't bake them something to take. I mean, that might not be the way to do it, but there's going to be other ways that you can just do something good for them. And do it in such a way, maybe, maybe they don't even know that you've done the good, but, but you need to know that you've done the good and do good for them. And then pray for them. Take them to the Lord. Ask the Lord to bring good things in their life. And by the way, when, when you're praying for them, don't pray something negative. I mean, don't, don't pray, oh, Lord, let them trip and fall out. No, no pray good. <laughs> Blessings on their life. Trusting in the Lord for them. And like Paul, build relationships by seeking common ground. I long to see you so that I may impart to you a spiritual gift to make you strong. Uh, That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I I, I like those two verses together because, you know, he writes out, he starts out saying, I I really want to, I want to, I want to bless you. I want to give you something good. But you know what? I I know in truth, I'm going to get more than than I give. We're going to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. So you, you find the commonalities. You find the links. Many of the links that Paul has with these folks in Rome that he's never met before are other people. 
You know, and that's that list of 30-some folks that he's, he's speaking blessings on and, and encouraging them to receive. Uh, the, this is a commonality, it's things they have in common. When you meet somebody and you begin to talk with them, uh, I, don't, I don't know how, how you do that, but for me, I, I'm quickly looking for, in my conversation, things, that I, things I have in common, whether it's experiences or places or people, uh, looking for things in common because that's where you begin to build a relationship uh, with them is those links. And, and then to pray for them. And as you simply begin praying for them, that's why we've asked you to begin for Friend Day. We've been asking you to pray. And I'm so thankful for, uh, as I look out there and I see all those names, spot, pause and pray for the names that are in, the, on those, in those balls and the display out there. Uh, these are people you're praying for. Uh, that's exciting because that's how you, how you build redemptive relationships and move towards gospel conversations. So I ask you to, to do the card, is to keep those names in front of you, to pray for them. And then as you get to know them, to, to simply ask them, how can I pray for you? And, and let them share and then the next step would be, can I pray with you? I mean, that then really opens the door for, for gospel conversation. So find those links and, and use them to build relationships and, then, and pray for them. And then, um, well, the other is to avoid the kinks, the things that, well, the things that we allow become, to become excuses as to why we're not building relationships. We just don't have the time. We're afraid of being rejected, the risk of being hurt. You know, those, those are true, right? Those are true risks. When you put yourself out to build a relationship, there's, there's always that risk. They're going to reject you. They're going to reject Christ, and so you feel like they've rejected you. But friends, those, those risks are nothing when you compare the cost that Christ paid for us on the cross, the price he paid to restore our relationship with the Father. Because again, this is all relational. In the kingdom of God, relationships are the currency of that kingdom. The economy of that kingdom is, is relationships. And so we invest in his kingdom by investing in others. So we too should have the same passion the same sense of urgency that, that Paul has. Right, verse 13, 14, or right, all those verses there, but verse 14, he says, I'm, I'm obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. There's an urgency in him. He knows that the time is short, and time is now to be, be redemptive and to be sharing the gospel because Christ is coming again. And I just remind you, God wants to be part of all of your relationships, all of your friendships. Don't, don't live life having, oh, these are my church friends, and these are my school friends, or these are my work friends. No, they, these are all friends for Christ. Relationships that God is going to use, where he's going to use you to bring the good news of the gospel to them. In closing, hear Paul's words in verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And I pray that those words could be, can come roll right off of your tongue. That you're not ashamed of the gospel that you're aware that God is giving you opportunities to share it, uh, to invite others to Christ, to have gospel conversations, and that you set that as a priority in your, in your life and in your thinking, that you begin to look at the people in your life with a positive attitude and to pray for them regularly, that God will use you for his glory. Now, we've been talking about friendship and about building friendships with Christ. You know, one of the beautiful things um, as, we, as we read Jesus' last words with his disciples, 
was Jesus' statement. He's saying, I no longer count you as servants because a servant doesn't know what his master's business is. But I have called you friends. See, Christ wants to make you his friend. What an awesome thought that the creator of the universe desires a relationship with us that is intimate, that is, that is true, that is friendship. If you're here today and you don't have that relationship with Christ, well, the good news of the gospel is that today is the day of salvation, that today you can simply confess your need for a Savior and call upon him and, and commit your life to him as your Lord, repenting of your sin, and he will save you. You can enter into that relationship with him today, and we invite you to do just that. But as we pause and pray, as we consider what we've heard today from the Word of God, let us be recommitted in our own lives to investing in other people, to praying for them, and to inviting them to Christ. Would you pray with me right now? Heavenly Father, as we've gathered together today to worship you, we've asked for your presence and we've listened to your word, and we've seen in your servant Paul the importance of, of building friendships for Jesus. Lord, we want to be who you've called us to be, ambassadors of your kingdom. Lord, I thank you for each one that's here today. And I know that no one's here by mistake, but you've brought us together. You want us to hear from you. And there may be some that today are, are hearing of the good news of the gospel, of salvation available to them. And Lord, I pray that you'd give them faith that this morning they would respond to you and to your invitation to life. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters and, and Lord, maybe for relationships in their life that are damaged and they need to, to, to seek your forgiveness and, and lift them up to you. Lord, I, I pray that you'd change each of our hearts that you might use us for your kingdom and your glory. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.